Doing that, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to, uh, let's see. I think we're going to go ahead and just hit verse 8 because we usually try to recover just a little bit to get us up to speed. Verse 8, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit? Okay, so um, the inheritance related to the land and to the son. And basically, Abraham is saying, look, I want to know for sure. Like, a, this is a sure knowledge um, because he, he could say this. He could say, okay, um, you've given me promises. You just said that I have faith, you know. You know, I got all this good stuff going for, for me, but I would like this practical in my life. I'd like the sun to come forth, not just talk about and have faith and go, oh, this is really good. You know, which is like a lot of Christians, you know, that don't press on past the promises. You know, they just take the promises and go, okay. And then, oh, and then they write a precious promise book and then... <laughs> And, and then you, you know, uh, and then you sit around in faith forever without any real reality of Christ. So I believe that he's saying, I'd, we'd like this son to come forth, and we want it to be real. And um, uh, another thing that he could say at this point that maybe you don't realize is he could say, Lord, I've been in the land for 10 years now. That, at this point, he's been in there 10 years. And I'm really, you know, I'm ready for some things to happen here. I'm still, uh, I'm still living as, as a stranger in this land. I'm still childless. Um, so there's this, there's this drive in him for the sun to come forth. Now, isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful to have that, to, to just keep on pressing, you know. And that's the way Paul described it. I press towards the mark. Keep on, Lord, I want you. You know, if the Lord said something to us like, you know, well, you know, your faith is counted to you for righteousness, we would probably build a ministry around it and spread that as an evangelist of look what God said to me instead of going, okay, I'm glad that you appreciate the faith that I have that it's going to happen. But Lord, and this is exactly what he's doing, but Lord, I want the Son I want to hold the sun. I want to have the sun instead of believing that and believe in your promises. So, and he's going, it's been 10 years. I've been here 10 years. <laughs> I really haven't possessed hardly anything. <laughs> so can we, can, we, can we kick this thing up a little bit? How shall I know? Whereby shall I know that I will inherit? And so... Um, of course, the Lord, there's, you know, there's that factor that the Lord is waiting. We say, what? 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 I mean, have you ever done this? Lord, why are you waiting? You know I want Jesus. You know I want the Son. Why is this taking so long? I mean, and you just, you know, and it, it's just frustrating. Well, he can't tell us, but you need to understand. I can tell you. He won't tell you, but I'll tell you. He's, he's waiting for some situation to happen. Either you get so old that it's impossible for you to bring it forth, or you're a virgin that can't have, you're unable as a virgin to have a son, to bring forth a son. All of it is, I'm not able in my condition. And that's when he, that's when he shows up. See? So we go, what are you waiting on? Oh, I know he's waiting for the big moment. Yeah, for him the big moment is when you shut up and quit. <laughs> you, you say, I have no more strength, no more ability. I, um, I, I have not the wherewithal within me anymore. You waited this, you know, we would say you waited too late. You waited too late, now look at me. And he's going, you are perfect. Let's start. <laughs> Praise God. All right. 
So, verse 9, And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Um, so that's when, this is what the Lord says when he asks how. Where, you know, whereby shall I know? How shall I know? God, of course, leads him to a place where he's no longer going to tell him He's going to show him. Okay, I'm going to show you. You know, sometimes we just get used to being told stuff. We just get it all the time. We get being told stuff, and it goes in, and, you know, who knows where it goes? You know, I mean, it could go right out the other ear. You know that. But the Lord takes him, and he says, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Go get some sacrificial animals. And, um, you know, someone could say, well, you know, Randy, this isn't the full gamut of what Israel offered because you left out the most important part. You left out that it doesn't mention a lamb. But I see that all of these animals together represent the spirit of that lamb. The spirit of it is within that. And there's your lamb. It is one. And you know, the, uh, what is it? Um, Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, <clears throat> to present your bodies, plural, a living sacrifice, singular. Okay? Present these bodies as a living sacrifice sacrifice or as in this case a given sacrifice so um, I also notice the wording he says take me and heifer of three years take me or take unto me and when I saw that I went mm, this is proof because I knew it wasn't a sin offering I mean I knew that it wasn't this is this is this is in relationship to the son so if God says take me an offering well, he's never sinned, so it can't be a sin offering. It has to be a sweet savor offering. It has to be one of the offerings that represent Christ, not for sin, not for wrong, not for whatever's done bad, trespass offerings and all of that kind of stuff, but just a sacrificial spirit that rises to the Father, that pleases him because that's his son, not Thank you, Jesus, for bearing all this filth that is them. <laughs> we say thank you, Jesus, more than he does. He's like, you know. But when that sweet savor rises, that's just his son. That's just purity old father getting purity old son. Excuse my text in there, purity old. <laughs> um, so then... Uh, I wrote down a couple of things. There must be a death to everything. So all these animals are brought in. And in another sense, I think they all can represent another, some aspect within us. You know, there's, because we got a lot of aspects in us, don't we, that need to be, go to the cross. And I think that they represent that. And I think that that's what he's saying here is that, you know, this is, um, this represents death to everything. Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit? Right here, death to everything. That the Son can come forth. See, we, I don't know, we, we always cringe at death, you know, much less death to everything. Death, the Father says, I demand death to everything. And we go, you're such a mean daddy, you know. No, he's going to bring forth the most precious thing he has inside of us, his son. My Lord, we should be, every time we hear that, we ought to be going, yay! Death to everything so that Jesus can come forth, the lamb can come forth, yay! The resurrection, which is him. Did you have something or you just... Didn't understand, like, I've earned death, and like, you know, wage is a good thing to earn a wage. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, the Holy Spirit just twisted it all around in my mind and went, No, this is you've earned this, and you're getting it, and it's happening. Yeah, and she's yay, <laughs> 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 except for through Christ. 
<laughs> well, I have a reversal of that, and that was when we used to go down to Mardi Gras, I made a button. Y'all remember that I used to make buttons and stuff, and I made a button, black button with the skull and crossbones on it, and then I put writing on it real small, so you had to get up to read it. And, and all kind of weird people would see it, the crossbones, and they go, Oh, yeah, that's cool, man. Skull and crossbones, yeah. And I said, what's it say? The wages of sin is death. <laughs> anyway, yours was much more spiritual than mine. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a, a phrase that is going to be coming out of my mouth a lot is death is the answer. And in, and in all of these things, death is the only answer. We have to be given so that the sun can come forth. And we do that not just because of all the stuff wrong. We do that eventually. I mean, at first, we're, we're glad to run to the altar because, you know, it's not really our death. It's his death on the altar, and he died for our sins. And we run to the altar and say, forgive me of my sins. Okay, that's fine. Good. Keep it up. <laughs> but. Eventually, you go to that altar and you say, I want to be with you. I want to be in you. I want, to, I want to go down into your death. I am crucified with Christ. See, it, it, it never says crucify yourself. And it never says, you know, that there's a death apart from him. Even, even when he's talking about just carrying that about, I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And that has nothing to do with sin, your sin or anybody else's. That has everything to do with his nature, him, 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 not his. You know, his forgiveness, his salvation that he gives us, his healing. And pretty soon, everything switches. It starts switching inside of you, and you begin to go, you know, I am I'm grateful that I'm saved. I am... I am so thankful for all of the blessings you've given me. But it's all been about me. You began to come to that. You can go, it's all been about me. I mean, and I didn't realize it. I would just take it and go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And next thing, you got another one? <laughs> you know? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, and, and uh, I just love you, Jesus, because you bless me all the time. You know, and you give me stuff, and you, you know, and he's going, well, good, that's my heart to do that. But he never says, are you going to join with me in this spirit? Are you going to start giving back, not, not based on sin, not based on problems, but based on, Lord, I am sorry that I made this whole thing about me. Wasn't there a worship song like that? It's all about you. It's all, I'm sorry for the... Let's just sing that song right now. I'm kidding. <laughs> but but you, you understand. You understand from that song. And that, that song became really popular. And people really, I think, for a time, and then went back to, you know, but... It, it should be, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have, like in heaven, it doesn't have a throne with Jesus, the lamb, the slaughtered lamb on it, and everybody worship it, worshiping him, and they say, okay, this was lamb week, now next week it's going to be Randy week on the throne, you know, and then we're going to move to, you know, <laughs> Chris week, and then we're going to move on down, you know, and everybody's going to get a turn. No, throughout the eternal ages to come. To love him, to know him. I had someone, when I was sharing this once in a conference, they came up to me and said, well, if we're going to do that throughout the eternal ages to come, then, you know, he'll get it then. <laughs> and I went, well, that's real perceptive of you <laughs> to, to figure out how not to worship Jesus and to love him and to make it about him. That's really good. Um, all right, so... Uh, I wrote down in sacrifice, we finally see the power of death. Because um, it, I've said it over and over, but 
it is never really about the death. It's the spirit in which it was given. Because you got, you got Jesus on the cross, and then you got a thief, and on the other side, another thief. And there's only one cross there that matters to God. It's only one cross that matters to God. Because of why? Well, because God's partial. No, there was only one death that truly, truly, truly was dying for others at its own expense. That was truly pure in heart. Truly pure in heart. And, you know, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, I think that's true, because that seeing there is probably ongoing, but I would say the pure in heart probably saw God first and understood God. God. Because it didn't say the Father or the Son or Jesus. It said God. And it's in the Trinity that you see that selfless giving flowing between them first and foremost. And then another thing that I saw in this was um, uh, that they they opened all of the the sacrifices and laid them open and put them side by side but the doves they didn't do that to and I thought well that's strange because the dove represents the Holy Spirit and then I realized that the Holy Spirit is totally sacrificial, but he never died on a cross. He never had the, the thing, the knife put to him by someone outside of himself. He just came, and he, he's still here, totally selfless in his ways. And so that was one way that I was looking at it. All right, so let's look at... Um, Well, again, verse 9, take me, uh, and then he starts talking about the different things. And I was just, I try to picture these things. I try to enter into them on a certain front. You can read something, and it's just a story about something that happened long ago. You can watch a TV show, and it's just about this or that. But from early, I have always tried to just kind of step in there. Even if I was not a part, I'm just, I'm there watching. And, and in doing that, I'm trying to see what are the dynamics that are taking. And one of the things I saw when I was kind of doing this was that, the, that God said, here, come here. You want me to show you? You want to know whereby? You can have assurance that you're going to get the son, and we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to go back into the sacrifice and the death, and, and that, you know, I can just quickly say that the first thing was God showed him the stars and said, you know, so shall thy seed be, and Abraham is moved not by the stars or the magnitude of the stars or the magnitude of the seed, because every place it talks about it it said he believed God the, he believed the one that's showing it to him so he's looking at him and him being you know this is the son to me this is what he's like this is how he is in my heart this is how he is than my seeing of him and Abraham's going well that's a lot different than the seed I was thinking I was just going to get a little baby you know what I mean and uh so then he says, well, but then, well, that's good that, I, you know, I got faith. And it's counted to me from righteousness, but whereby shall I know? He said, okay, if you want to know, then this is what's in my heart with the sun, with the stars. But this is what the sun's going to look like. Bring me these offerings and these offerings and these offerings and these offerings. Bring every kind of offering that's a clean animal, and let's, let's go through them all together. And so, I mean, he you know, like I said, I'm kind of in the picture. 
And I notice that he sort of takes him to the altar. I'll show you. I'll show you. So he takes him to the altar. And then, you know, all of that starts taking place. And I was reminded of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son didn't understand the father's heart. But he understood hunger. He understood lack. He had been brought to a place of lack, of weakness, of emptiness. And he said, I should go back to my father's house. There's plenty of bread. So he gets up and comes. And the father, before he can say anything, the father rushes to him and kisses him. And then he starts saying, I'm, you know, no longer worthy to be called a son. So the father starts putting all this stuff that is the, the best, the best robe, the best clothes, the best, you know. He's almost treating him like beyond what he was as a son. <laughs> He's almost treating him like the son. And so the prodigal son is looking up at his father. Again, that's what I, I'm trying to communicate that in the Abraham story, Abraham must have been looking in because he said he believed him. I believe not, not all this up here, all this great visual of the stars and of the, the representation of the seed. But I, I believe in you. And then he takes him to the altar, prodigal son story. He puts all that on him. And then he says, look, go get the fatted calf. And I've, I've always believed in that story. And all these stories that we're going through, they all do that. They all go to the altar. They do. In every one of them. It's always that has to take place. So, so I see the father who's been talking about his son now say, okay, now, if you really want to know, your knowing is going to be in relationship to the sacrifice. It's going to be in relationship to the altar. And here's what I want you to see of my son, what he's like. So I had mentioned last week that this was when, he, when he's talking, you know, he says, take me, a heifer, take me this, take me that, take me this and sacrifice them, that it was crucified language. He talks, his, his, all, his, the altar is the way he talks. Or may I say it like this, the altar is the way that he communicates. This has always been his mode of communication. The whole plan of God, as far as what we call the plan of God, certainly the plan of salvation, but I mean, it's all there. You have to be taken to the altar. That's why even, even in services where people come up to pray, they, they talk about coming up to the altar. Come up and receive Jesus. It starts at the altar. And you have to come to the cross. You have to, to, to like follow through on the Father's leading. Come, and I will show you. And he's going to show you the lamb is going to show you the nature of the one who is the sacrifice. <clears throat> and then I wrote down, Abram has a little, just a little time to meditate because God told him to go get these animals that were three years old, right? So he's got a little bit of time to meditate uh, on the altar as he gathers three-year-old animals. Uh, so... I started thinking about participation <clears throat> because one, there are these things. So it's like Abraham stands here and God stands here and God is showing him this. And then God says, bring, bring this. You bring this. You bring to me the correct sacrifice the one that I'm asking for. That's important. My God, that's, the, that's not just saying, well, you know, God believes in sacrifice and death, and I'll just bring something, and I'll, I'll die to my CD collection. 
Well, good, because everything's going streaming now. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, just kidding. But, uh, you know, we would do that. You know, well, I'm ready to give them up now. <laughs> do, you, do you have an Apple Music account? Well, yes, Lord, but I'm... <laughs> But it is, it is the Lord who has is, who is shown his own heart. He's, he's like the sacrifice there. He's opened his heart up to show his heart for his son. And then he says, you bring me. You participate. We're going to do the altar together. We're going to be together in this. See, it's not just, you know, we'll just go die. <laughs> you know, we'll just go die and and I'll I'll find you dead somewhere and then I'll, you know, I'll raise you up by Christ. He'll be your resurrection. <laughs> no, it's not that spirit. It is let's do this altar together. You're not, you know, you're going to be the sacrifice. So learn to bring the sacrifice. Let's learn. Let's start learning now. Well, some of you know the end of this Abraham story. We see who the real sacrifice was. It wasn't Isaac. It was the father willing to give up this, his beloved son. And that changed everything. That, that did it then. That settled it. <clears throat> then he says, you know, all, all of these are that are three years old have to be put to death. Okay, so Jesus was on the earth for 33 and a half years, but really he only ministered publicly and was known for about three years. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth has to die. <laughs> Everything three years, we're going to have to put it down. We're going to have to bury it. We're going to have to put it away. because. And that's why, isn't it interesting that Jesus in resurrection is called the new man? He's not that Jesus of Nazareth guy. And when I say Jesus, here's what I'm talking about. We go to the Gospels, and we look in, we look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see what Jesus was like. And then the New Testament over in the epistles starts saying, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And we say, well, I'm going to be a healer. And I'm going to be a miracle worker. And I'm going to, I'm going to walk around and bless people. And it's going to be good. You know? And uh, no. That man has to die. And then we are found in him. Not having our own righteousness. Not having our own. We're found in him. And he's the fullness of that filleth all and in all. And we find him complete, our relationship, for example, Jesus of Nazareth, to relate to him, the closest thing you could do was be a disciple and walk with him for three and a half years. Walk with him. We go, oh, I know what Jesus was like. You know. Well, no, you don't. And one of those who walked with him, one of those who did walk with him for three and a half years, writes later after he's gone, that which was from the beginning. He's not talking about that started when he got born. He doesn't start his, that's John, he doesn't start, you know, uh, his gospel at the birth of Jesus or at the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry that began to declare Jesus or, you know, those, those areas. Even Luke went back to Adam. But he's saying that which is from the beginning. This has been, he's been around forever, which we have seen, which we have heard, which is, we've touched with our hands. He is, he's not talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He's talking about that which was from the beginning. I have recognized that the one that came was not just a prophet, was not just a, uh, even if we say, well, he was the son of God, we still see him in terms of, this is what the 
son of God is like in terms of that ministry. But no, he's, he's speaking of him in a completely different way. And then Paul comes along, and he starts describing him. He starts describing everything totally out of whack with everything they did. You know, even the, even the disciples early on, they're looking at the cross. I mean, not physically, but, you know, after it's over with, and they're going, you know, repent and be forgiven of your sins. This is, their, this is how they're approaching it. And Paul looks at the cross and he goes, I am crucified with Christ and so are all of y'all. <laughs> you know, it's a completely different thing. It's a completely different relationship. It's completely different how you're seeing him. And, you know, whether you understand what I'm saying or not is not important at this moment. But it is important that one day you take the three-year relationship and you put it to death. And the Lord seemed to be interested in it because he said, everything th three years, bring it. <laughs> you know, because it has to, this is how we begin. You know, because Abraham had already done many altars before that. You know that, right? He had, but none with God standing right there. <laughs> none with God telling him what he wanted. You know, there, and, and I, I mentioned this somewhere along the line, but it felt, it, it, fell on me that it was kind of funny that Abraham's doing all of these altars and there is no description of what those altars mean. That was like, well, this is crazy to me. After I thought about it, I'm just going, that's just crazy. It wasn't really until the tabernacle and, you know, Israel came out of, of Egypt that they began to be really um, spoken of. But more than that, there was, there was the altar, and then God shows up, and then he's telling him, I want this, and I want this kind, and I want it this age. And now it's like Abraham is, I've done a lot of altars, but now I get to step into you. Now I get to be with you. Now I hear your heart. Now I'm not just walking through this trying to do the best I can and, and be with you, but I'm not with you because I don't know what your heart is in this. And, and so he, you know, I know that it's like the prodigal son, I believe. I believe that the prodigal son is, is looking at the fatted calf being killed and probably seen a ton of them before that time. But he's looking at his father now. And he's seeing his father's joy, he's seeing this, the father, and it's as if the father is explaining, this is us, this is who we are, this is who you are with me as your father. This is what we do. We go into death, and then, and then you know, we, 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 we take that, that sacrifice and we put it to death, and then we eat it. We put it on the inside of us, and this is, you know, Come on, son, you went, you did all this stuff and you probably thought you were going to please me at somewhere along the line, but this is what pleases me, the life in you, and the life in you is this. It's this offering. It's this sweet savor. It's this, this is meat to me, meat indeed. Didn't Jesus say something like that? My flesh is meat indeed. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> oh, and so I just see Abraham. It's like this is a new experience. I'm, I'm, I'm participating. I'm participating with you in the way that you're ordering it instead of the way I think it's supposed to be ordered. Can I get a oh me at least? <laughs> so, um, and then it, he said, the Lord said, because this is participation, bring this to me. Bring this to me. This is what he wants. This is what I want. I want, you know, Lord, what do you want me to bring? Some stuff we can kill. <laughs> I mean, 
some stuff that would be willing to go into death. Because remember, they had to be willing sacrifices. I mean, that's uh, to this day, that's major prerequisite. And then Abraham, Abram, you put him to death. That's going to be beneficial down in chapter 22. It's going to be, you, you need a little practice before you come to that day. You need it. God has to, has to bring us through that so that, we'll, so that it begins to be. And, and you remember when God said, offer up your son. I mean, he, he didn't hesitate. He didn't. Forget the movie you saw. <laughs> Somebody said, did you see the movie, the Bible? And I said, I read the book. It was better. <laughs> anyway, sorry. And then, uh, I actually didn't say that to him. Uh, you lay them in order. You lay it in order. All right, so this is beginning to be a, a, a lesson on God's perspective concerning sacrifice. I could tell you, I could do it for you. You know, I could, I could do it, the Father could say. But I need you to start learning that there's an order to this. There is, and there is a real order to this. And, in fact, that's actually what I got right next. You lay them in order, you open them up, and you lay them, the pieces, in order. And this is the order, side by side, with the insides facing up to me, the Father would say. The insides facing up. We are really good at hiding the insides, folks. And I just hope that if this ever this video goes on YouTube, it doesn't stop right here while I'm holding my hand like this. <laughs> because have you ever noticed how YouTube videos, you know? It's like, anyway. <laughs> we genuinely are good at hiding our insides. And if, you're, if it's going to be this, his sacrifice, you're going to have to open that up. You're going to have to present it to God. You're going to have to say, this is, this is my insides. This is the order that I want, the Lord would say, the Father would say. This is what I call in order. You go, well, let's go from the, the biggest animal to the little and lay them on a big, long line, and that will be really orderly. He didn't, he didn't mention what order the animals would be laid in. What he calls order is that the insides be shown upward to him for sacrifice. So that's, you know, may the Lord, may the Lord speak to us on these things. I mean, I'm not done yet, but may the Lord speak to us on these things. I mean, we, we can sit in the class and we can hear it. We can even be moved in class. But we, we do hide stuff. We do, ha you know, people talk about skeletons in their closets. Some people, the closet's the only place they don't have a skeleton. You know, it's like, don't go in my house. Don't go upstairs. <clears throat> In my house, don't go upstairs. No skeletons, but, well, there might even be some of those. I don't know. But I know um, that when we can be open to the Lord, then we can start being open to one another. I mean, you know, you do know where trust comes from, right? Trust. Trust comes from truth. Trust comes from truth. If you get the truth from somebody regularly, and there's no shady this or that, you begin to trust them. 
you know, if somebody is shady or they're lying all the time or whatever, it's like, you know, I want to trust, but, you know what I mean? It's like, is this time it is, is it a lie or is this whatever? Truth, to be, to have that openness that we say, okay, you know what? I'm not everything that I look like, but I want Jesus formed in me. Is that right? I, I mean, to, first of all, you say that to the Lord. You just say it. You could say that to him right now under your breath without even, you know, you could say, I'm not everything that I want to be. I've got junk in me. But I want this stuff out so that it can be your son. And that when you look on the insides, the insides is Jesus. You know? And if you, if you start practicing that, and I mean, you know, come on, if we can be open with God, then we, we can, you know. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm in no way saying, okay, this is you, here's the knife, just walk around and say, hey, look, this is me. Isn't it ugly? <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not, I, I don't believe in just exposing somebody or whatever. I, I believe that somebody that might have done something wrong, maybe if you don't expose them right off, but you try to bring them through, that they'll maybe take the, they'll walk through it with you. But if you just expose it, then, you know, then they, they do what any of us would do. It'd be like a, a rabbit out in the desert in the dark and the light shine down and, goes, ah, and heads for the nearest, you know, um, tumbleweed. <laughs> Y'all have tumbleweeds? And, okay, yeah, because we got them here too. All right, verse, uh, well, we'll do 10 and 11. Let me just look here. Yeah. And he, and he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another and the birds divide, divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. All right, so you got two sets of birds here. You got birds of prey and you got sacrificial birds. Okay? The sacrificial birds are laid out They've been given to the Lord. The birds of prey are wanting to pick at their flesh. Okay. And there's a lot, I, there's no way I'm going to cover all of some of these areas tonight, but because um, I know that I have a lot to go back over. But uh, as I thought about this, I was thinking about Noah's Ark, and I was thinking there were two kinds of birds. There was raven and dove. And... He sent out the raven first, and it didn't come back, but clearly the new creation hadn't been formed yet, right? So, now this is just me, but I'm, I'm looking at that. <laughs> I'm so funny how I do but I'm looking at this raven go out, and he's, he's like flying all over and going, there is no place to put my feet. I need just enough strength to get back to the ark. So he lands on top of the ark, and he goes, when this thing gets there, I'll, I'll make it. He's not in. He's not in Christ. He's not part of that. He's independent. And he's on top of it while the ark floats, waiting for the waters to go down. And then when it's down, maybe, maybe, maybe he survived. And if he did, he can say, I survived because, you know, he can, he can start his story. He can put it in the news and, you know, have all the reporters come see him. I know, you're going, where's the news and the reporters? It's, <laughs> and uh, I told you this, didn't, you know, but, and, and tell them, you know, I survive. I'm a survivor. <laughs> and they said, well, how'd you survive? Well, I... I just wrote it out. I, you know, I made sure I didn't go back in, so he sent me out. I didn't want, to, you know. And the dove. 
Well, he's not, he's not, you know, and a, and a raven, I don't know if you know much about ravens, but they have them in, in Ireland and stuff like that. And I mean, they are loud and they are also predators. They are. And um, uh, you ever heard of, I uh, can't even remember his poem, Nevermore? Who is it? Yeah, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, they're considered dark, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry that I do depart from things every once in a while, but when I was in Florida, <laughs> this is, you gotta know this. How many of you know Mike Gentry? All right. <clears throat> so Mike Gentry is uh, being, uh, becoming the assistant pastor under Pastor David there at their church. And they asked me to come down and be in a service that, that promotes him. And so before I leave, some guy comes into the church who hadn't been there in, you know, a year or so. And he's got all of this, you know, stuff. And he says, uh, and he doesn't even know Mike or, or any of his family or anything. And he comes in and he says, well, uh, Mike Gentry's son-in-law, which is Lisa's husband, which lives in McKinney, so he's never met him. He's a witch. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and he said, uh, and Mike Gentry has a dark spirit. You know, yeah. A dark spirit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I said, you know, Mike, I, uh, so he, he's, Mike's telling me this, you know, and he's concerned he wants me to pray. <laughs> Picked the wrong guy, buddy. Not really. So I said, well, you know, I have kind of noticed that dark thing following you around. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, oh, yeah, it's your shadow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, sorry, but it, it, he didn't laugh at first. Are you on there, Mike? Is Mike on there? Good. Let me say some bad stuff. Since he's off, then I can say. Okay. So Mike, really, I just want you all to know that he, one time. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Mike never did anything wrong ever. And he was my best friend, but he got to watch the show. <laughs> he did. He did. He got to watch the show. You don't know how much I've paid him in bribes not to tell everybody my stuff. <laughs> All right, so we're not supposed to find rest outside of the ark. <laughs> okay? We're not supposed to be ravens finding rest outside of the ark. And so there's this, um, well, maybe I shouldn't get into this next part um, because it starts having to do with um, driving away. Yeah. Let, let me just end with reading this, okay? It's just scriptures. Uh, and when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards <clears throat> shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kizites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephiams and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites and the, I don't know, I can't think of a, a funny name to add to that. What? 
and the mosquito bites. What? The stalactites and stalagmites. I can trust the body of Christ to come through, <laughs> to come through when a man needs. <laughs> oh, I'm just sorry you people are so bound up that you can't have fun. <laughs> Praise God. Well, you know, I hope that y'all are realizing that this little area we're fixing to get into is going to be pretty deep. It's going to have some stuff. And this is all because Abraham said, how shall I know that I'm going to inherit, this, the seed is going to come? And the Lord's saying, okay, I'll show you. But everything I show you, we need to start, before I show you that, we need to start with the sacrifice. <laughs> Let's get that done, and then this won't be so bad. Amen. Because you'll be with him. You'll be with me, he says. You'll be with me in heart. You'll be with me in spirit. And Abraham, at, at the end of that, didn't seem all freaked out. Because it, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. My God, if we can have the real Lord with us at all times, then we're not, we don't, let's put it this way, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. Father, we just love you. We love your son. We love your word and we love your spirit that moves upon it, upon the waters of the word and stirs them up and lets us see what's beneath the waves and the, what's beneath in the depths of your heart found in the word of God. Wash us with the water of the word. Fill us with the water of the word. Strengthen us by your might, by your mind, by your heart. Bring us more and more, not just to you, but into you. Bring us into the reality that is truly real and not religious. Surround us with those that seek your son, that put him first, that long for him, that won't give up. Surround us with those of that, of, of that like precious faith. And, and Father, as you move and as you minister, Lord, bring forth of the seeds that have been put within us, the seed which is Christ and the seed of the word. Bring it forth, bring it forth, Lord, into real fruit, into real life as a result of real life within us, as a result of divine life flowing in us. And then when it comes forth, may every, every word out of our mouth be, I didn't do this, I didn't produce it, and it's not even my fruit, it's him, it's Jesus. May we give him all the glory, Father, for truly he deserves all the glory. So, Father, as it is with Abraham, bring us to that place of weakness. Bring us to that place where we finally realize we're unable and in, in the sadness of our heart, we say the time is past. But in joy of your heart, you say the time is just beginning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.